to Hub Dialogues. I'm your host, Sean Spear, editor-at-large at The Hub. I'm honored to be joined by David Frum for another installment of our bi-weekly podcast and video series, From Dialogues. David, as listeners and viewers know, is a staff writer at The Atlantic, the author of several books, and a highly coveted guest and commentator on various cable television programs. We're honored to provide him with a platform to share his insights and analysis on key issues concerning Canadian policy and politics. In today's episode, we're discussing the growing politicization of the private sector and what some of these trends may tell us about the state of contemporary conservative politics. David, thank you for joining me as always. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Uh, one of this week's regular episodes of the Hub's Dialogues podcast was about the growing demands on businesses to adopt political positions by their customers, employers, and investors. David, what do you make of these developments? Are, are we living in an era of so-called political capitalism, or is it more complicated than that? Well, I, I'm not sure um, that it's true, first of, first of all. I think we, we just no longer see certain kinds of issues as political as they used to be. Um, you know, for, for mostly 30 years after World War II, politics were dominated by a struggle between management and labor unions. Um, and uh, businesses had strong views about the place of unions. Now, we don't see that today as the ideological, we're no longer interested in that kind of bread and butter, meat and potatoes politics. We want cultural politics. And because it wasn't a cultural battle so much, or we don't, we, we can't see it as a cultural battle, we, we've w wiped it from our memory, but it, it was very real. Questions of whether you cross a picket line. Um, those, those were, those are uh, flashpoints in the politics of the 1950s and the 1960s. I think what's changed now is um, both the, what politics is about. It's much more expressive. It's much more about meaning and values and identity. Uh, it's much more about things that don't put money directly in or out of people's pockets. And, and the pressures have changed. And, and in particular, um, companies that depend very heavily on the skills and human capital of their workers um, are finding that they are under pressure from within to express the values, you know, and is that a surprise when, when companies make offers to workers um, that they don't, especially highly skilled workers, they don't always pay them as much money um, as a pure theory of the economy might suggest they should. So they say to people, well, we're, we're going to, you know, all those things you see when you go into a, a, a new startup, the, the ping pong table and the free snacks, they're all ways of saying we value you as people in ways that we don't express with money. And the, it's not surprising that workers then say, or employees then say, okay, fine, um, but I don't just want you to honor me with a ping pong table. I also want you to actualize my values because you're not giving me all the cash I could command. Um, you know, one thing that's interesting about these developments is that it doesn't quite um, line up with the state of broader U.S. politics, which is to say U.S. politics are essentially deadlocked. The share of the public that identifies as Republican and Democrat are broadly similar. Yet, I think it's fair to say that the extent to which major corporations are adopting political or policy positions, they tend to tilt progressive, particularly on these issues of culture and identity. So. What do you ex ex think explains this growing gap between corporate politics and the American yeah. public? Yeah, well, first, um, one should be careful about overcrediting corporations. Most corporations stay far away from it. Most corporations adhere to the rule so brilliantly stated by Michael Jordan, both Republicans and Democrats buy running shoes. Um, but there are a couple of things that every corporation bumps into. and. Um, uh, you know, young people are more valuable as consumers because their preferences are more fluid. Um, you know, you or I just think what it would take to make us change our brand of toothpaste. Um, I mean, literally, the marketing department would have to come into our houses with boxes and boxes of the free product um, and persuade us that it really was better uh, because we're, we're set in our ways. If you're 24, 25, you're much less set in your ways. Um, and... Um, and the companies are also most interested in, in people who have more money to spend. And one of the things that I think and accentuates this conflict is um, that, you know, uh, the, the look at, well, the, the ground zero for this conflict has been Florida, the, um, that the people who have the most disposable income, the people whom the companies most want to talk to, the, the kind of workers with high human capital but lower wages whom the companies are trying to appease, those people tilt left. 
Um, but the Florida state legislature tilts right because conservatives are overrepresented in politics, just as more progressive people are overrepresented in um, disposable income um, and in high skilled, lower wage employees. Hmm. Um, so that you, you mentioned Florida. Let me take you up on that point. Um, in response to the trends that we've been discussing, we've seen growing hostility towards big business on the part of Republican lawmakers. Um, New York Times columnist Russ Douthit recently described this development as, quote, striking evolution from the party's historic position. David, what are we to make of this change? Is it merely uh, Trump's influence on Republican politics or does it reflect a broader realignment of the American political landscape? Um, I, I think there's less to that in particular meets the eye. Look, if, if you went to the state of Florida or Georgia or any of those states in 1965, uh, you would find lots of backwoods members of the state legislature who are very upset about northern corporations forcing integration on them. Um, so what's happened is that those kinds of le backwoods legislators were once in the Democratic Party and now they're in the Republican Party. And they still are um, offended by the cultural changes that, um, you know, I, that Disney is more understandably more responsive to the parts of the country that have more money to spend at Disney parks. Disney is responsive to its own employees. And what, you, what you're hearing, the same way as you would have he heard in 1965, is people frustrated by their lack of cultural and economic power using their overrepresentation of the political system to get their way. The particular thing about the Disney Florida struggle, and I don't know whether you'd call this comic or tragic, is how Governor DeSantis got dragged into a fight by his backwoods legislature, legislators in a way that probably he didn't want. Um, Disney has been incredibly supportive of the career of DeSantis. I don't think he wanted this fight at all, but uh, he got he saw an opportunity um, to uh, best Donald Trump in the competition as the angriest man in America. Uh, and then when Disney, uh, but with, with his support for these bills on um Sexual te sexuality and teaching, and this, and the, the bill was a pretty demont, a pretty symbolic bill. But when Disney spoke out, then DeSantis found himself pressed from behind to take an action against against Disney. Now, my view of it is that he is fervently hoping that the procedural defects in the bill will cause the whole thing to collapse before it goes into effect next year. Um, but he got pushed, and one of the messages that he sent, and this is, I think, one of the things that's really. Um, powerful about what happened here was he is signaling to all parts of the Republican coalition, Donald Trump kept leading you into his fights. I will follow you into your fights. Hmm. Yeah, let me um, let me pick up that point because you, you, you have such an interesting take uh, on um, on the Florida bill. Why is it a sign um, that DeSantis is weaker and more responsive to the conservative entertainment complex, as you call it, than yeah. Donald Trump? Uh, because he is being branded in ways that are just not are obviously not good for him. Um, who was Ron DeSantis four months ago? Never mind what the, the highly involved people in politics. How, how was Ron DeSantis seen in Florida and uh, broadly? And how was he ready to be seen by a broader public? This was uh, this was someone who had argued for a economy first approach to COVID. That's pretty popular. And th this was a man who bet his political career that opening the schools early was the right call. And it was the right call. Um, so he would, uh, and, but he'd also won a lot of buy-in from teachers because um, he had raised teacher pay. He'd offered them various benefits. So he was, he was the, the governor of tough love toward teachers, but love, not, not just tough, also love. He gave them more money. Um, but the, the governor who fought the fight to keep the schools open, and he had been proved right about that when the blue state governors had been proven wrong. That is a great image to take into a Nash, into a re-election in 2022 and into a national campaign in 2024. Now what is he? Now he's America's leading anti-gay crusader. That's what he is. Um, and, uh, and that's not a place you want to be, not in Florida in 22 and certainly not in the country in 24. Maybe it's good on Fox News. Maybe it's good in a Republican primary fight. But, you know, I, I think what he wanted to do was sort of nod in that direction. And now he's been pushed to go much deeper in that direction than it makes sense. And not only that, he's now taking this, these dramatic actions against the Disney Corporation, one of America's most popular, most respected companies, and in a way that is going to raise taxes of people uh, in, uh, in at least two counties in Florida and maybe through the state, 
because of the debt burden he has to assume, unless, and this is the part he's hoping for, unless the whole thing collapses as it might. And then, then, then he gets a respite. Uh, that, that's fascinating, David. Um, th thanks for that. Um, if I can come back to this broader question of um, business and politics and, and bring it closer to home in Canada, um, we've had some of these issues in our country. I think, for instance, of Tim Horton's controversial decision in 2015 to remove advertising from oil and gas companies in their locations, or the recent case of a beer company disting itself from conservative leadership candidate Pierre Polyev after he had hosted an event at its facility. But I think it's fair to say in general terms that the politicization of business seems more muted in Canada. What would you attribute that to? And to what extent is the federal ban on corporate donations to political parties possibly yeah. part of that explanation? Well, theoretically, corporate donations to political parties are banned in the United States, too, and have been since the Teddy Roosevelt administration. But in, in practice, the law is, 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 is much weaker here. Um, I, I think the beer situation is really anomalous, um, which is that, I, and I don't know enough of the details to know whether this was intended or unintended, but um, the, a company found itself in a position where it looked, where it was made to look as if it was backing one particular candidate, not just one particular party, but one candidate within a party. And obviously, that's not a position any company want, wants to be in. Republicans and Democrats buy running shoes. Liberals and conservatives drink beer. And also supporters <laughs> of other leadership, other conservative leadership candidates, all, they also drink beer. So I don't, you know, why do I want to be, you know, it's it's one thing that my that. When I, if I open my space, but that if the impression was created that that's some kind of endorsement, it's not a hostile act to say, I, I don't have a candidate in this race. And I, in the privacy of the voting booth, I, the owner, may, may indicate a preference one way or the other. But in my public life, I, you know, everyone who likes beer, I like you back. Um, so that's not so, so remarkable. I think generally Canada, Canadian politics have historically been less polarized and Canadian businesses have been more reticent. It's also true that many of the most, in Canada, many of the most important companies are regulated in a way the, the, the state regulated sector is more central to the economy banks energy um uh th th those kinds of they're more regulated and so of course they want to you know be on the good side of of everybody and it's also true that canadian politics have historically and until recently been less polarized and uh, Canadian voters are more likely to drift back and forth across partisan lines. I, I think that has been changing in the 21st century, uh, but that legacy is still very real. Um, I asked earlier, David, about changes in American conservative politics. I'd like to come back to that discussion, if it's okay. Um, recently, we had American Enterprise Institute fellow Matthew Cononetti on the Hub Dialogues podcast to discuss his new book, The Right, The Hundred-Year War for American Conservatism. Uh, in the book, he argues that there's long been a tension between a conservative establishment and the movement's more populist forces. But for most of history, uh, modern history, that is, the establishment policed the movement. Uh, what do you think's happened? How did we go from Bill Buckley calling out the John Birch Society to so many yeah. establishment conservatives today recon reconciling themselves with a Trumpian politics? Well, let me just bracket those words, establishment and conservative. I, I'm not sure... I think they mean something. I just don't think they mean the same things to everybody who work, uses the words, and so they, they can be dangerous and misleading. Um, but here's here's the way I, I would think about this, and this is not just in, true in the United States. It's true everywhere. Um, that across the developed world, in, say, 1985, the conservative, the right of center party drew a lot of support from people who benefited from the open economy, open trade, um, and the people who were more uncomfortable with those things, they ended up in left of center parties. Um, not completely, but over time, that situation has tended to reverse itself. Uh, that if, if you are someone who benefits strongly from the new globalized world economy in the United States, you are more, much more likely these days to be a Democrat than you are a Republican. And if you're a mm -hmm. loser from that globalized world, you are very likely to be a Republican. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so the Republican Party has ended up with this conflict between its stated principles and its voting base. And I, I've been writing now for 20 years. That th this was going to have to come into harmony one way or another. I, the Republicans, and this is the thing that I long argued, needed to reach out to the voters who liked their, I, their policies and their principles, or else inevitably the voters they had would drag the policies and principles into alignment with the interests of those voters. And that, that's what's happening now. 
um, that, that that's that's what this this Disney fight is about. Um, the idea that, that like, if there is one thing that you would think that the people influenced by Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman and um, Bill Buckley would say is that the use of state power to punish one particular company for criticizing the government. Uh, that, if that's like, that's the thing we reject. And now that is clearly becoming clear that for so many people who write and talk on the government, that's the single thing they are most excited about. Uh, um, uh, Rick Scott, the Senator from Florida, who is vying to replace Mitch McConnell as the leader of the Republicans in the Senate recently released an 11 point so-called policy plan for Republicans. And if you look at it, it's just, as vapor as vaporous as it could be, it's not any kind of plan. But even as vaporous as it is, it's not notable that the words healthcare nowhere appear in the eleven point plans. I mean, it's not even that there isn't content to the words. It's the words themselves do not appear. The Republican Party spent a dozen years promising to repeal and replace Obamacare. Now shrug, who cares? What they care about is punishing companies that criticize their guy, and that politics of cultural revenge. That's I think just about the only thing that excites them at all. And so the party has to adjust to that. And the failure of the party to be able to come up with any kind of healthcare plan that meets the commitments of the ideology and the interests of the voters, they've just given up. And so uh, the Republican party, and I've been predicting this now for a long time, has found itself the party of the post Obamacare healthcare status quo with nothing to say. Um, and just a lot of zombie-like actions in defense of the status quo. Um, I have a couple of final questions, but before I get there, it's just worth uh, noting for our listeners and viewers um, to some of the points that you just made, David, that you were making the case long ago, including in your um, book, Comeback, um, that Republican politics needed to modernize its policy agenda to apply conservative principles to the issues facing its new and emerging um, voters and the failure to do so, of course, has contributed to right. where we find ourselves today. Um, one of the questions you, you often hear or read is whether these establishment Republicans who embrace populism and a more confrontational politics are sincere or merely performative. Um, what's your view on that question? How much of it is a sincere reaction to the radicalization of left wing politics? In other words, how much of American politics these days and its polarization can be understood as a, a dialogue between the left and the right, as yeah. opposed to merely um, the, the kind of performative politics that it's sometimes characterized as? Yeah. Again, I, I have to bracket these words establishment and populist because I don't, we're not all going to mean the same things by them and they, they can subtract from understanding rather than add to it. But, but here's, here's a way to think about this and what is so strange. Um, there does seem to be there post 2012, um, there seems to have been the, the rise of this very vociferous progressive politics. And some people attribute it to the rise of the smartphone and other people think it has to do with disappointments of the, with the second Obama term, whatever the cause, um, it's, it's pushed, uh, to much more permissive attitudes on crime, uh, much more censorious attitudes toward the way people speak, um, a kind of a denigration of, um, you know, older American ideals and longer established American po population groups uh, in a way that people find very insulting. So one way to re re respond to this is to say, if you're the party of the center right and you watch the party of the center left being driven to madness, you think they're vacating a lot of territory that we could move into. Um, that at the crazier they get, the louder they talk, the softer we talk, the more appealing and, and acceptable we become and we can build a kind of majority. Instead, uh, what you see is, as you say, counter mobilization. Um, and uh, that doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense in a general election context. And it's a real mystery why if, if uh, I mean, if you think, for example, in Florida, if you think, wow, uh, this I'm getting real insight here from the libs of tip talk um, Twitter feed. This really is today's Democratic Party. They want sex change operations on eight year olds. That's that's just awful. And a lot of people in Tallahassee and Tampa and Jacksonville are going to be upset by that. So if we have a really solid health care agenda and uh, we're committed to keeping the schools open. We'll look good in comparison. And instead, they say, well, you know, look how crazy the libs of TikTok people that entitles. We're entitled uh, to be as crazy in reply because it's not fair 
that they get to be crazy and we don't. And you want to say, I, I thought you were in this game to win it. Uh, you know, and, and the way you win it is not by saying, let's match the other team craziness for craziness. You say, the way we win it is by putting our, by showing that our crazy people, and everyone has some, are securely in a box over in the corner, scratching and mewling, but causing no harm to the general public. And meanwhile, it's the grownups who are running our party. Our, with our party, you get school, uh, you get people who reopen the schools in, uh, when there's an, an ep epidemic going on that doesn't much threaten the health of young children. Um, yeah, that, that's who we are. We're the people who kept the schools open. But no, no, now we don't want to be that. We want to be the people who say um, that we are, uh, and, uh, we're the people who say that a, a gay teacher can't have a, a picture on the teacher's desk. Uh, and if, if anybody disagrees, we shut down Disney World. <laughs> um, let me wrap up with this question. Um, are there any incentives for more level-headed conservatives to push back against these trends? I mean, put differently, what will it take to reverse the trends that we've uh, talked about today? Well, I we talked before about corporate. What a joke would be to say this is not a serious proposal, but a ban on all contributions of less than two thousand dollars to political parties. That that. One of the things that um, was an unfortunate legacy of the Obama years was there's this view that the, the people who give small don donations that represent are, are real representatives of the population. And in fact, what you discover is the, the $200 donor is a fanatic. Um, maybe the $27 donor that Bernie Sanders had is a normal person, but the $200 donor, that person is a fanatic. And the more beholden you are to the $200 donor, the more you're going to be driven into places where your, you know, your vote-seeking interest doesn't want you to go. Um, I, I think po politics learns from the experiences of, of defeat. And I think but what's happened is because there, there's been so much, so many shocks uh, to the political system from other sources, whether it was the financial crisis, the slow recovery from the financial crisis, then the pandemic, then the inflation crime, that the out party can often win um, uh, without feeling any need to position itself as acceptable. Um, I, 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 I think I, I, I'm going to forget now whether I said this to you on one of the previous podcasts, but I remember traveling with um, uh, Phil Grant in 1996. He was running for president in 1996, a senator from Texas. And I watched him uh, scold a candidate for the House who was talking too much. And Graham said to the candidate, when you are running against an incumbent, there are only two issues, the incumbent's record and you're not a kook. That's, that was good advice, but it's not advice that people are taking because, uh, you know, it said, because they, they said, okay, I want to talk about the incumbent's record. Plus I am a kook and that seems <laughs> to be unwise. Uh, there's so much there, David. I won't um, keep you any longer, but um, just for Canadian viewers and listeners, I, I think it's, it's worth reflecting on your observations about the pros and cons of our relatively parsimonious campaign finance regime. I think there's an implicit presumption in a lot of Canadian discourse um, that uh, we've taken big money out of politics and that's an inherent good. Um, but I think your point about the extent to which it um, forces parties to galvanize their most vociferous voters in the name of financing their operation has consequences that are probably worth uh, thinking more about. Uh, in any case, uh, it's great to see you. Great to chat with you, as always. And look forward to Pleasure. picking up the conversation in a couple of weeks. Take care. Bye-bye.